On the last GigaChad guide, we formed India starting as the tiny yet powerful Sikh empire. It's a bit cursed though because we haven't integrated the EIC or its princely states yet. Since now you know how to form India, we're going to focus on how to actually shoot a nation's economy and standard of living up simultaneously while still also having fun. We're going to turn India into the most powerful world hegemon of the Victorian century in every aspect, and we'll do that by leveraging our massive population to essentially produce everything in existence. For a quick warning by the way, if your goal is to get standard of living higher at all costs, what I'm going to do to open up here is actually kind of a bad idea. But if your goal is to raise GDP, then it's definitely a good idea. Let's see what I mean soon. Also, upon further reflection, when I played these sections, I didn't actually play optimally because I got complacent from how powerful I was. I will mention times where I could have played better during this video, so you can learn from it still. With that out of the way, let's jump into our first moves as India. The first thing we're going to do is unite the peninsula by integrating our subjects. Funnily enough, this actually isn't quite optimal for keeping our standard of living high because we are now going to have to take care of a lot more people, but it lets us shoot our GDP much higher. Also, if you haven't already, just white piece whatever opponents you had in the previous war. At the end of the day, the big reason to integrate our subjects is access to their resources which they likely won't develop. Places like Bihar have 80 coal mines that the AI will barely use. We need that coal. Besides the utilitarian look at uniting the peninsula, the aesthetic look is important too. I want one big India, not some weird abomination of nations like we have now. If when you fought Britain, you declared war on them directly, and the EIC didn't join the war, you won't have a truce, so you can annex them immediately. If you do have a truce, then just work on your economy for a couple years while the truce goes up. When fighting the EIC, beware that they actually aren't a complete pushover, but we're going to use some sneaky naval tactics to defeat them much more easily. Go ahead and line up generals on all the fronts you've got. If you don't have enough generals, make some more until you do. Keep one around to send a naval invasion to Calcutta. The fronts against the princely states should fall pretty easily, as should most of the fronts, simply because we've got superior infantry to everyone here. Unlike the British and the Americans, the EIC still uses line infantry. Once you land in Calcutta, you may not necessarily instantly push through the whole country, but all you have to do is hold any piece of South Bengal in order to drain war support. So just go defensive if you can't break through and let the war support go down. In my game, I got very lucky in that the EIC sent me a surrender pretty early. I will explain how to make that happen more often, but quite frankly, I have no idea why they surrendered early, so best of luck I guess. It's okay if you have to wait anyway. With the EIC integrated, the little princely states will be much easier to handle. The only problem is that our infamy is extremely high. This might attract the attention of random great powers who will join the war and just make things take longer. This is fine, but inconvenient. So let's hope it doesn't happen as often to you as it did to me. Funny glitch here with Avad, by the way. The occupation I put them through during the previous war didn't go away, so when I went to annex them, I couldn't place troops in their front. Ching got involved in the incident, so war did break out, and they were already fully occupied, making this war much shorter than it could have been. Not sure how to reproduce this glitch, but it was funny. Around this time, I also made a mistake, which to be fair to me was only a mistake because of a glitch. There were Karen separatists in Burma that broke away, but I didn't really care about that little strip of land, so I simply gave it to them. The problem with this is that in Victoria 3 currently, any rebellion that breaks away will always be considered a rebelling country and will simply sit there in constant civil wars against itself and mark my country as being in civil war forever. For the entire rest of this video, you will be seeing the in civil war notification at the top of the screen. I can't do anything about this because I can't declare a diplomatic incident on a nation who is rebelling against me, meaning those Karen separatists are free to infinitely fight amongst themselves and I'm stuck with a civil war that will never end. Had I known this, I'd have fought them. Oh well. If you find yourself in a situation where there are separatists coming and you don't want to keep the land, don't let them go by backing down. Instead, release the land that's rebelling as a subject. I could have released Karen as a puppet and been fine here. Oh well. Let's move on. At this point, Austria declared a war to cut me down to size. This is pretty common since great powers will kinda just declare wars on you for having a high infamy. Nothing to worry about though. Austria can't do much to us from here. We'll have to occupy a piece of them to get any war support drain though, so that'll be a pain, but we can land in Venice and just hold out until we win. In a way, this is a good thing since we can get war reparations. In fact, I kinda need them looking at this balance. The war against Austria and Russia, who joined as well, was relatively uneventful. To get war operations against Russia, just occupy any piece of Siberia. Russia probably won't even fight you. To get it from Austria, keep landing in Venice or Istria until you get a foothold, and then hold out as long as possible each time. It will probably kick you out of their land every time, but eventually you'll drain their war support from holding their land since battles take time and they can't remove you fast enough to not lose war support. 
Once peace comes, the budget is definitely in an awful place. I'm going to do a tactical bankruptcy. At this point, we have truces with most of the powers that have beef with me, so I'm going to cut my losses, go bankrupt, and focus on the internal now. Once you declare bankruptcy, you'll get a lot of radicals and a pretty awful modifier, but you won't have to pay any more interest on your loans and can avoid a debt spiral. In this case, it's quite worthwhile to bankrupt, actually. I'm going to end the Peninsula Unification section here, even though we haven't actually quite annexed everyone, nor have we gotten through the foreign treaty ports, but we'll do that soon. For now, we're going to focus on how standard of living works in Victoria 3, because that's one of the main goals of this section of the guide. Standard of living is based on exactly two things, wages and expenses. The amount of money that a pop makes at their job is weighed against how much they spend on taxes and goods. Wages from a job are based on what the job is, with higher qualification jobs generally paying higher amounts, and the wealth of the state the job is in. The higher the standard of living of a state, the higher all wages go in that area. The way that the player manipulates jobs is by using production methods that generate higher paying jobs. For example, a tool workshop that uses steel tools creates machinists and engineers while reducing laborers. Laborers generally are an undesirable job, although better than peasants, so the more we get rid of laborers in exchange for higher qualifying jobs, the better wages will be. Simultaneously, higher wages mean businesses will have a harder time making money. So it's important that we be keeping the output goods of the industries expensive. Driving up prices can be done in a few ways, but usually just exporting things, even if it isn't the best for tariffs, is a good way to keep prices up. Let's take a look at any of these businesses and figure out how to identify a healthy business and an unhealthy one. I'm going to skip far ahead into the run just to locate some good footage of me looking at businesses, then we'll jump back to where we were before. First off, an unhealthy business, these munitions plants. They're currently operating at a loss because lead is expensive and ammunition is cheap. The way we can fix this would be to reduce the cost of lead and to increase the cost of ammunition. In this case, I might increase ammunition's cost by going to war or I could have a larger standing army which will consume it passively, or more simply, I can export ammunition to other countries. For lead, I could consider securing more lead by building more mines, or using production methods that increase lead output in my current lead mines, alongside the simple answer of importing more lead. If you look at the lead mines in Rajasthan, we can see that they're making an absolute killing because of lead's high price. This is great for the owners of the lead mine, but bad for literally every other industry around here. Nonetheless, this is an example of a successful industry. Input goods are relatively cheap, and output goods are expensive. The problem here is that our output good is more important to the supply chain of our nation. What we'd prefer is for goods which are final products to be expensive. Things like clothes and furniture or food ought to be expensive. But then we run into the problem of the basic goods of survival for our pops being expensive. So how do we possibly solve these issues? Every good will be consumed by someone or something, be it personal use, industrial use, or government use. I'm going to come at this run with a free market laissez-faire approach because that's the governmental form I have right now, and I don't want to rock the boat. So what would a libertarian do to ensure that goods remain affordable across all sectors of the market? Well, the classic libertarian talking point is, of course, to cut taxes. Remember that when taxes are lower, all pops, including owners of businesses, can afford to spend more on goods. They could spend more than they can afford more expensive goods, even if they're above average price. One thing which limits us, which I hadn't really considered until after, was that we could have created more jobs by subsidizing industries which allow for highly paying jobs even if the outputs don't sell very well. In theory, with the current laissez-faire system I have, any industry which can't make money, even if it would help the standard of living, will fail. I should have swapped to interventionism at some point and subsidized the highest paying industries to create better wages, but I didn't think about it until after I wrote the script, so my bad. I will go over other ways to improve standard of living in other GigaChad guides where different nations will use different techniques, but for now we're essentially going to be constructing a libertarian paradise here in India. Just keep in mind this is not THE way to play the game, rather it's simply A way to play. Let's jump back to our tactical bankruptcy from earlier. We can see the government balance increasing after the bankruptcy. This is because we no longer owe any debts, but then it keeps increasing. Why is that exactly? Well, the GDP is increasing, and as the GDP goes up, the government is able to mint more currency for its own budget. Our GDP is extremely rapidly climbing because of all the industries that are getting built. You might be wondering how exactly we can simultaneously have bankrupted the nation and still be building nearly 300 construction points worth of buildings. This is because the investment pool that we're generating off the back of our capitalists, who are funding the continued development of their own interests. In this case, 
The interest of the capitalists is also our own, since they pay taxes, albeit low taxes, and also provide jobs for our people who benefit from the wages. Along with that, I've been integrating the states around India and building government administrations to keep tax capacity high for all these new industries. It's important that if you're going to spam out 50 paper mills somewhere, that those mills be built where there is sufficient tax capacity such that those people actually pay taxes. Remember that tax waste is exactly that. Waste. It's not that the people pay fewer taxes, it's that the government receives less of the tax, making the remainder go off into the void. It's not a strategy to simply inefficiently tax your people so they have more money, unfortunately. Despite how much money we're getting off the investment pool, we're gonna need more so we can keep feeding the beast of industry. There's a particular technology that does wonders for that. Mutual funds. With mutual funds, you can tack on extra capitalist jobs to literally every building in the game. Once we've got mutual funds, we're gonna go into our buildings and change everything to be publicly traded. With everything being publicly traded, the number of capitalist jobs will skyrocket and we'll be able to build more construction sites. The nice thing about construction sites is that they also generate jobs, which in theory get paid out from the government treasury as wages, but in reality they're being paid by the private sector thanks to our investment pool. These wages from construction come back to us in the form of taxes on those workers whose wages are paid by capitalists. This creates a loop of building industries which create successful capitalists. These capitalists fund the investment pool which we use to build things. Those things that we build create more capitalists and also create wages for our citizens. We are taxing every part of this process and thus generate a large government budget, while expanding the economy and keeping taxes as low as possible. Man, if only libertarianism were this based in reality. From here, we'll have to figure out which goods are worth producing. We can't just build 200 buildings and hope they'll be profitable. We can check our market for expensive goods and attempt to produce more of them. For the guide's purpose, this could be anything in your market, so I won't list a particular example, but essentially keep building up an industry until it's no longer profitable to build more of it, and then either find ways to make the industry continue to be profitable by reducing its input costs, or find a new industry to build up. Repeat this process to your heart's content and then check your GDP line. By the way, if America or Britain try to cut you down to size, just get their war operations for like no effort by doing the Gambia method, which I covered in the first part of this guide. Check the description or the card in the top right. Thanks. You should see your GDP growing pretty fast at this point, and as your budget increases, don't just build up gold reserves. Get more construction sites which will let you build more stuff, further increasing your GDP. Also, make sure you're using the most advanced production methods because we want our pops to be getting the highest wages possible. I would go over more here, but this process essentially takes care of itself. Just don't stop building and keep expanding the construction sector alongside your budget and investment pool. Your standard of living should be creeping up and your GDP will be ascending to new heights. The reason our standard of living goes up relatively slowly is because as India, we have like a quarter billion people to give jobs to. It's going to be a long process to pull the tens of millions of peasants we have out of the farms. So even with all this construction, it's going to take time. In a smaller nation, this libertarian strategy could see the standard of living climbing almost as fast as the GDP, but then you won't have all the raw resources to pull it off. So it's kind of a weird give and take. An important note here as well when it comes to the continued expansion of the economy is that as the GDP grows, so too does your credit limit. Remember that money is borrowed against the cash reserves of your industries. At the same time, our interest rate is laughably low at about 2% thanks to being laissez-faire, which means the government budget is more or less irrelevant. So long as we build faster than we can accrue debt relative to the maximum debt, we can actually outpace our own interest payments through minting. You'll notice throughout this section of the video that my budget is often negative, yet my economy doesn't collapse. This is actually how many modern day economies work, where they borrow money against their GDP, but grow the GDP faster than the interest rate. It's a common misunderstanding that a high debt level is bad. That being said, if the GDP isn't growing, then a debt-oriented economy will quickly collapse. This is why we have another problem on our hands, both in real life and in-game, which is directly caused by this style of economics. You're going to eventually run out of natural resources. Despite India's massive size and massive raw resources, there are only so many trees to chop down and so many minerals to extract. We can't continue to outpace our debt through growth if there are no more raw resources with which to grow. Also, India has no oil and only a little bit of rubber in Sri Lanka. This means we're going to have to do some American-style interventionism across the earth for new resources. This playstyle is exactly a style of play which makes colonialism not just strong, but necessary. My economy will collapse relatively quickly after it stops expanding. It seems like it's time to spread freedom to the uncivilized nations of Asia so that we might give them better jobs and use their untapped resources to expand the ever-consuming economy. Strap in.
The first bottleneck I ran into was for lead. There is a surprising lack of lead across India. Your major sources are Orissa, Rajasthan, and Baluchistan. There is, however, one more source which is not yet under our control, Korea. A nice, compact, far-flung part of the world with only China to protect it. China, who has outdated troops and is, for all intents and purposes, a paper tiger. Korea also has iron and trees for us, which they simply aren't using. It would be a shame if all that raw material were to remain unexploited. How about we bring Korea into our empire? This war against Korea is pretty simple and more or less just goes by without any hitches. If you want, you can add war goals to Qing, but I didn't want to waste my time fighting them, so I just let China off the hook for this war. When we take Korea, we're going to build literally every raw resource that they have with the best possible production methods to keep things efficient. What we're doing is also going to have a curious side effect. See, we have a lot of peasants back home who would love to get better jobs. At the same time, we allow migration. I also have colonial resettlement, which gives migration attraction to unincorporated states. This means Korea's population is suddenly going to become a minority as the massive influx of industry to the region will create jobs which the locals simply cannot fill, be it due to a lack of numbers or a lack of education. It's going to look pretty funny, especially because India is super multicultural. We have quite a few accepted cultures which will just be flooding into Korea. The next big thing that happened was some kind of socialist political movement to protect workers or something. And the way I look at it, we have such a good budget we can probably afford to put in some workers' rights. I decided to implement workplace safety, which means worker mortality will drastically decrease, furthering the prosperity of our people. The next bottleneck I faced was oil. It's always oil. Luckily, there was a source right beside me in Iraq, which was ruled by the Ottomans. It was going to be easy pickings, so I just went for it. There are three major oil sources which are easily available to me. Basra, Mosul, and Fars. These three states are ruled by independent nations with weak armies. There was also oil in the Trucial states, but they had British protection and I was far too lazy to go against Britain. I wanted easy wars I could knock out quickly for oil access, not really a big slog. In the war against the Ottomans, I simultaneously invaded Basra and Constantinople so I could split their focus and occupy their capital to make the war go faster. This made them collapse pretty fast. From there, I did what I did to Korea. I built up every raw resource in the area, especially the oil, and watched literal millions of peasants from India migrate over to fill up the new jobs. Also, just wanted to point out a mistake that Paradox made with regards to Sikhism in Victoria 3. I got this event called the Golden Mean, which is basically an event about one party saying another party is bad or something. That's all fine and dandy. But the dialogue option says, and thank Allah that they do. Well, at the end of the day, Allah just means God in Arabic, and Sikhism is monotheistic, meaning calling the god of Sikhism God or Allah or Rab or whatever term you'd like to use is fine. The common term for God to Sikh people is Wahaiguru, though. In particular, due to the animosity between Muslims and Sikhs, calling the god of Sikhism Allah is a little bit of an oopsie. Would recommend switching it to Wahaiguru, or at least just God to be more neutral. This has been my TED Talk. Another little thing for Paradox, there's this annoying bug in Victoria 3, well, maybe not bug, but likely unintended feature, where a breakaway nation can have a civil war itself. Check out this Kurdistan. These guys are an uprising against me, but they had a civil war themselves who I'm not hostile to. Why is that? Now that part of Kurdistan gets to just escape my country and I have no recourse besides starting another war after my current one with the other Kurdistan is done. Either make it so that rebels can't have rebels, or make it so that when rebels have rebels, the overlord nation fighting the first tier rebels can fight the second tier rebels or something. This has been my second TED talk. Anyway, from here the empire now has oil. So I put on every production method that used oil, and oh my god look at those oil rig profits. The business is generating 121,000 pounds of surplus income. That is an immense amount of money. Basra state has a level 25 standard of living on average. Damn. Check out the population split too. This is what I meant about the multicultural immigration of the Indian Empire. About 40% of Basra's people are from India, and they're all coming there to work the oil rigs and get a share of those immense profits. We can see the standard of living across the nation going up as peasants are lifted out of their farms to go off and work across the empire in better and better jobs. This is the power of colonial resettlement. If you have too much population, just conquer a place and make profitable industries overseas that can encourage workers to move over there and find new, better work. From here, I decided to just start fighting random wars on whoever I felt like challenging. I chose Britain, since they're kind of like our ultimate rival. I also wanted the land in Madagascar whose owner they had as a protectorate. I wanted their rubber, you see. But more than that, I wanted something to do besides stare at the GDP and stand the living lines. Britain did fight pretty hard, and Germany intervened with some chemical warfare, but that was fine. I just kept naval invading Yorkshire until I won, which I did eventually. 
I then did to England as it already happened to Iraq and Korea, and I actually managed to make Bengalis a majority of the population in Lancashire by the end of the game. That was pretty funny. With 10 years to go, I just started going crazy to make time pass. I wanted to genuinely complete the campaign, so I slogged through the extremely laggy and pretty often crashing game to bring you guys a genuine 1936 finish. From here, I invaded Manchuria for more logging, and I invaded Persia for prettier borders and oil. Man, there's not really much more of interest that happened. I enacted workers' rights and got serfs up without realizing it. Then I put in women's suffrage, as well as proportional taxation, just to make taxes a bit more efficient. I also put up a protectionist trade policy to try and starve the world of my resources, lest they pay immense tariffs, which was nice. I was considering going isolationist, but ultimately I relied on exports for creating demand for my goods, so I kept my economy at least a little open. I also puppeted Britain just for the fun of it, but also because it lets me control Canada and their immense forests. Then the game crashed. Then I annexed the Trucial States for even more oil, but by that point it was 1935, so I was just passing time. There is no strategic point to doing any of this final stuff since I was already the number one power in every aspect, and the game was ending in a year. Anyway, here's the final stats of the Empire at the end of the day. You can see where the economy just started going out of control thanks to the libertarian management. Mutual funds is an insane technology when combined with a big enough construction sector. You can literally just outscale your own debt and live off the back of the investment pool. So long as you keep growing, the economy cannot die. This way of doing things is perfect for nations with access to natural resources and an army to acquire more if they run out. Generally speaking, libertarian playstyles work best for countries that have already gotten pretty far ahead and want to keep going further. So long as there is room to grow, then a libertarian economy will grow. But without growth, its debt will catch up to it and eventually pull it down. So that's India. Starting as the humble Sikh Empire, we've put Punjabis onto the pedestal of world hegemon. No nation can compete with the Indian Empire and its unending economic growth. I'll definitely check out some other nations and apply different strategies to them in the near future for other Giga Chad guides, but I'm really happy with this run because the Sikh Empire holds a special place in my heart. I grew up in a city called Surrey here in British Columbia. This city has a massive Punjabi Sikh minority which composed basically my entire friend group growing up. I learned basic Punjabi at a young age and became pretty familiar with Sikhism thanks to that, and a lot of my food tastes come from the Punjabi community. They're great people, and a lot of my closest friends are from this community. Ranjit Singh is an important figure to basically every Punjabi who knows their history, and being able to take his ambitions to this level was lots of fun. By the way, if you enjoyed the video, consider learning a bit about the Sikhs and their religion if you're interested. You can also subscribe and like the video, but you know, who really cares about that? Hope you enjoyed the video. Stay tuned for more Victoria 3 Giga Chad guides and the Victoria 3 Comprehensive Critique video essay, all coming soon. Thank you for your time.